Real Talk family. Sorry about the echoey sounds, but we are on location with Bill Wofford out at Five Points Distilling. And Bill, you make the amazing, illustrious Lone Elm 100% Texas wheat whiskey. Is that correct? Sweet. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Um, I Nobody watches the podcast, so I'll just tell everybody. Uh, no, I'm just joking. But um, <laughs> a lot of times people like to ask me, like, what is your favorite Texas whiskey? And that is a difficult question because, as most people know, I am a huge supporter of Texas whiskeys. Mm -hmm. But um, if you guys aren't the favorite, you're definitely tied for favorite. I love your product. Oh, great. Thank and you. So we're going to take you guys on a little tour. We are live on location, so you may be hearing some background noise. There's actual, I mean, we're in a working distillery. Right. So if you hear some banging, apologize for that. And so first off, I just want to get some basic information okay. about the distillery. How long have you guys been in business? When did you when did you start? We started in late 2011. We decided to do it late 2011. And uh, we started building this, this particular building plant in 2012. Okay. We completed this building uh, mid-2013 and made our first straight wheat whiskey. Gotcha. In this building. Right. And uh, your location is a little bit unique. Um, the, I mean, maybe the closest that I've seen that has this much land is maybe Garrison Brothers, <laughs> uh, but you guys are on about 10 acres out yeah, here. Yeah. You have two different buildings and it's actually a, a pretty fun tour and you guys yeah. do a lot of outdoor events here, right. barbecue competitions and things like that. Right. And so if you're ever in Texas and you want to have a good time, definitely check out Five Points Distilling. Um, but you've been around for, actually, that's a good long time in the Texas yeah. whiskey world. Yeah, yeah. yeah one well, of, we're one eight of, years one in. One, yeah. of, one of the early adopters, one of the first people to get a distiller special permit in the state of Texas. Right. And I've often heard it said, and I'm going to rub a little salt in the wound here. So, okay. Yeah, okay. so I've often, I've often heard it said that uh, the, the best way to make a small fortune in distilling is to start with a large fortune. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> and that's what we've been doing, right? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah we, we're, we're still on a cash call basis, right? We're a small craft, right? Uh, distribution's difficult, right? It's, 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 it's hard, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of push for the big name brands, right? Sure, uh, sure. They have a lot of money to push into the advertising, and that's basically what drives the business, more or less, is yeah. advertising. Yeah, and there's been some pretty difficult hurdles that you guys have had to face throughout the years. And we're going to talk more about that. We'll probably talk about that when we get over to the tasting room. But right now, let's talk about your process. So you're right. you're ninety percent red winter wheat. We are ninety percent soft red winter wheat, right there. Okay, check that and, out. And distilling is and distilling is uh, it's all it's all about your ingredients. It's all about your cook. It's all about your fermentation. All about your distillation. It's like baking, mm -hmm. a lot like baking, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to make a good cake. You got to start with good flour. Okay. Then how the time and temp. You cook, mix and cook the cake, determines whether it rises or falls or how it tastes, right? How fluffy it is. And of course we have an extra step. Yeah, yeah. Our icing is distillation. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, you know, and I'm a big proponent of tasting everything that goes into the mash. Uh -huh. Fermented, the fermented mash, the sweet mash, the sour mash, all the way through, right? If you're not tasting it, you're not getting it right. Sure, sure. And that's the key, I think, to anything you do is to taste. So what is your background that caused you to develop this level of knowledge with regard to uh, I have a doctorate in physical chemistry from Texas A&M. Okay. And so... Gig them. Whoop. Whoop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. I, if you didn't know... Aggies drink low now. <laughs> that's right. If you didn't know, class of double O. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm a little before that. Yeah, a little bit. A little yeah. bit before that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's don't go there. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, you know, doing those... Uh, uh, Chemi co-ops and all that kind of stuff. You get a lot of experience in distilling. Sure, sure. Awesome, awesome. But my, I did not have any experience in specific, in specific yeah. distillations or making mash or anything like that, but I did have the general background. That's awesome, that's awesome. And so you guys are getting your wheat from who? Right here on the East Fork of the Trinity. Okay. So it's grown right here by us. So this is 100% Texas whiskey and like even your grain is Texas. Right here, no, grown, yeah, grown within three miles of us. Wow, that is amazing. So that's, it's grown right here. Uh, we've got uh, two ranchers right here. They grow a lot of uh, red winter here to, to feed the cows. Awesome. We've got several thousand head right across and they're growing the wheat for us. Well, let's run over and, uh, and, and take a look at uh, what you do to your, to your red winter wheat before you throw it in the fermenter. Right, cool. All right, so here we are. This is where you do your mash. 
Yeah. And your mash is a little bit different than what you would typically get, in, say, in Kentucky, correct? Right. This is a mash ton. It's not a lotter ton. We don't lotter out the grain. So we're graining all the way through the process. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of reasons. Uh, it's easy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's harder to pump, of course. It's more viscous, especially the rye and the wheat. But it also cleans the pot on each run and gives us fresh copper okay. on each run. Okay. So it's a simple way to clean the pot. And it, and copper is important for distillation. Copper is so. important for the distillation. You want to make sure you have a catalyzed pathway so you don't make ethyl carbamate, which is a carcinogen. How long do you typically um, have it in the in the mash for? Is it is that a, a so here process? so uh, so let's take bourbon right? Mm -hmm. So bourbon, you cook the corn. You say say you're making Wellers, Makers, Crow, any of those. Mm -hmm. Seventy percent corn, fifteen percent malted barley, fifteen percent wheat. Mm -hmm. So you cook the corn about two hundred degrees for 45 minutes to an hour, drop down and drop the wheat in at 165, cook mm -hmm. for another hour, drop down and put your malted barley in at 145. Okay. Each grain scalds at a different temperature, but your malted barley you add last at a lower temp so you don't destroy the alpha and beta amylase, amylase enzymes that break down the carbohydrates to the simple sugar so the yeast can attack it. Mm -hmm. So here we, we, start either, we start either with wheat mm -hmm. at 165 and cook, or we start with a, a wheat rye mix and cook at 165, or if we're making just say uh, all you know a single malt, we start with all barley. What ingredients you put in? Mm -hmm. Again, it's like making a cake, right? What ingredients you put in? How you do that time and temp on the mash determine the outcome of this what, product, what, right? What the flavor is going to be? Yeah, right. And what you want to do is taste that. You taste the ingredients going in, and you taste it coming out. There's no substitute for smell and taste in this right. business, right? Oh yeah, you can buy some expensive analytical equipment, right? But there's no substitute for smell and taste. Right, right. So I, we taste everything, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so and, and you, you, you know, it's going to come in there and it's going to go in as flour, and it's going to be sugary sweet. Uh, I've I tasted mean, just it before. sticky, sugary sweet. Yeah, it, ta it, it, it tastes like uh, cream of wheat. Like cream of wheat. Yeah, like some, you can some eat, sort of cereal. You can eat what comes out of here for breakfast. Yeah, yeah. Now, corn, I don't recommend that. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah. make a good breakfast no, cereal. But wheat are, <laughs> the, wheat are the right, makes pretty good breakfast cereal. But yeah, the, the wheat makes the best breakfast cereal. Nice. So you nice. can have that for breakfast when you're done. So we, we do that, then we cool it down here. We've got a cooling jacket. So um, now we back set here to control the pH, right? So I had some of the previous distilled mash back to the system to control okay. the pH, right? Awesome. And uh, I was under the mistaken uh, belief that you guys use sweet mesh here, so that's that's interesting. So it's kind of it's kind it's a hybrid. Yeah, awesome. we back set. Back that's set. the way to say it. We back set. So we do that, and then we cool this down, and then we pitch the yeast and hydrate it here. So we about eighty or ninety degrees. We can we can pitch the bring yeast. the yeast to that temperature, hydrate it, and bring it in here. Awesome. Once we've mixed all that up, the the yeast is aerobic to begin with likes oxygen like crazy and starts to boil and boom you're off to the races we're off to the races well let's go check out the fermenter cool let's do it now we're over here in the fermenting room mm -hmm. and um i noticed that the the mash tank was actually attached to the floor in there so how do yeah. you move the product from over there uh, uh, just here? stainless steel pipes right so mm -hmm. we just pump it through stainless steel pipes uh, uh, so it's just transferred into these mash tun, um, these these fermenters, and these are just open top. So we're typical kind of Kentucky, where it's just open top fermentation. You no know, beer fermenters are closed, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to drink that product, but we're going to distill it, so we don't worry about it. Right. But we do what we do worry about is how fast that fermentation happens. Right. So one of the keys to our whiskey is a nice, slow, long, temperature controlled fermentation. Right. We use these chill, you know, these chill jackets to keep it controlled and con control the room temperature. Right, right. We keep the room closed. You don't want outside uh, yeast getting in and you don't, or infections, right? Mm -hmm. And you can easily tell when they're infected, right? Right. Uh, but, so we do a one, we're on a one week cycle, since summer or winter, we ferment for one week. Seven days is actually very long, for, very long for the industry. Right. So you, we can't get too cold; the yeast won't function. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't get too hot; you get the, all these off flavors. Mm -hmm. So we keep a about a seventy-four degree constant temperature, mm -hmm. even when it's initially exothermic. Right. We cool that down. We keep it at seventy-four, as it's making the CO two and the ethanol right. from the sugar. You know, if you're open open building, say Kentucky, it's summer. You're not, you're not gonna, you're not, three days it's over. Right. It's sure. gonna go really fast. In yeah, the winter yeah. it's gonna go much slower. Okay. So they, there's no way to temperature control that, right? So they're kind of at the mercy. Of course, most of them they don't, they close down in the summer. Right, right? they don't. They close for the summer right. to do all their they maintenance. They do maintenance and whatever. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. But for you guys, you have a temperature controlled system, so right. you can run your all round. year, right? Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Right, and we're we're very small here. I mean, these are five hundred. We're a five hundred gallon batch system, right? So we get one fifty three gallon barrel a day <laughs> out of the out of the one still, right? Right. So we're very small, so we can control things really well. Awesome. And so yeah, so that how you do that time and temp again comes into play, and we 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 take that very seriously, and we do that one week. I'm catching that there's a, a consistent theme that you've created in your process, and that is control. Control. You, you guys like to control all the variables, whereas maybe some more traditional places in Kentucky, uh, they're more affected by elements or other things that might right. be outside influences, but you guys are in control of each Yeah, that's probably of my semiconductor background where you have to keep everything in a very, very narrow range to keep it to work, right? <laughs> yeah. it, it, you got a lot of room in this field, Yeah. but if you keep it tight, you get a nice tight profile, and that's, that's, how, we get, that's how we get that the consistency. Smooth, sweet whiskey that we yeah. make, right? Awesome. Well, let's go check out the still. Let's do it. All right, here we are in front of your Vendome Copper. Brass and Copper Works. Brass and Copper Works. 500 uh, gallon pot still. Pot still. And, and, and this is, my understanding, the most famous pot still manufacturer in the world. In the world is Vendome. Yeah, this, so, is, this is German copper, comes from Germany. Mm -hmm. Very nice copper, very nice thick copper and then fashioned by Vendome. And it's an art, right? We got a steam jacket and, the, and then the pot, the onion for more surface area, and then four tray system with a deflamator at the top or a cold trap at the top. So what we can do with this still is finely distill, mm -hmm. make those heads, tails, and hearts cuts the way we want to make them. The way you want them. The way we want them to get the whiskey we want. And it takes time. And you, and you can uh, distill to a, a pretty high proof in one run, right? Yeah, this, this still will put out about 180 okay. if you want it to. So you could almost go to a vodka level. Uh, yeah, you can distill twice in here and make vodka. Wow. We, wow. we still once in here, and then we use the pack column for vodka. Once you've used copper once, you don't have to use You can copper use all stainless. Time. Yeah. And yeah. so that, that's one of the things that's, that's you know, very different, but this would be considered kind of a hybrid still, right? Because it has the plates. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, you got pot still distillation where you're, you know, running it through and then you're putting it back in, you're running it through again. Yeah. Uh, but in here, that vapor kind of floats up and down inside that column until they get it separated the way that they want. And then it comes out over here, correct? Yeah. So, so you can do this many ways. You can use a straight pot with a lint arm or one plate and strip it. Mm -hmm. Then you can come back and do a finer distillation later. Mm -hmm. Now we found that for batch processing like we do, one single 12 hour distillation where we finally control the plates mm -hmm. and the reflux with the cold trap or the deflamator as they call it in Kentucky, mm -hmm. uh, we finally control that so we can finally separate the components into what we want. Mm -hmm. And well, that's how we get the profile that we want out of our whiskey, this, the smoothness. Gotcha. And, and the extra flavors. Your, your final, let's, let's walk over here to, yeah. um, and normally it's running, but luckily it's not because it's not too loud. <laughs> yeah, so it comes across, it, it condensed in the condenser. Uh-huh. And then it comes to the parrot here, and it, you know, it comes up through the glass and fills over. And so what would you, what would you say your final distribu your, uh, distillation proof is that you come off the still at? 160. 160. So you're pretty close to the legal limit for whiskey. We have, yeah, we could go higher easily, but we don't. We bring it down to 160. You, you, yeah, because you'd technically be light whiskey at that point. Yeah, right. So we do 160 overall. Right, right. But there's nothing in the regs about you can't be higher or lower as you go along, but the final product needs it's to be, be 160, 160. Gotcha. as distilled. And so that was one of the things that really struck me. The first time I came out here to Lone Elm, I was standing right here, I'm looking at it, I can, I can see the hydrometer, mm -hmm. and I ask, and they said, we come off at 160. I don't know of any other distillery that distills to that level um, consistently, and, and I'm told that they don't do so because they're stripping out too many flavors from their grain. Right. And so what I've tried to tell people is that this Texas red winter wheat that you're using mm. has so much grain flavor that yeah. even at 160, it's still one of the most robust flavors in whiskey that you can right. find. Yeah. So the, yeah, there's just different ways to skin that cat, right? Yeah. If you're doing it fast, then you, you're, you're stripping and then doubling and you're, you know, you get up to 140, 160 maybe, mm -hmm. right? And that, you're kind of stuck there. We come off high and do that separation very finely. How do you do this? You turn this? Yeah, but it's it's empty at the moment. I got they you. said some was going to come out. Oh yeah, yeah, cool. just a wee bit, just a wee bit. It's going to be some. It's going to be a little tailsy though. A little tailsy? Yeah, that's where the distillation stopped. Let me see. 
Yeah, Telsey. Little Telsey. Okay. Honestly, this does not smell like your normal distillate. I've tried your. Uh, your this is the very end of the. This is the tails have been distilled here, so. So th there's probably a lot. Throw of, that off right there. Uh, there's probably a lot of. Uh, a lot of flavor there. A lot of flavor, but a lot of uh, esters and whatnot in there. The heavier. Con the heavier alcohols. The heavier con congeners are in there. Mm. Okay. So, give that a fling. And let's get the center. Let's get the center. So this is the heart. This is what we're going for. This for those of you who don't know, the term, I can't tell heads nor tails of that is a distiller's term. <laughs> You've got your heads, which are your lighter compounds. Your like methanol. Methanol and... Light esters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things like that. Things that are not Ethers. good to drink. You don't want to drink those. That, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll cause macular that goes degeneration. In, that goes in the first cut. And then you've got your heart. That's the good stuff. Sweet ethanol. And then you've got your tails. And there's some flavor in there, but you, you, you don't want to put the wrong amount of your tails. In right. Your you want to separate those well. And what, one of the things you can't do if you're just quick stripping and doubling is you can't separate those, con those, those tail congeners very well. And do you know what um, grain this is? This is. Is this the wheat or does it have rye in it? Go ahead and taste it. I, I'm, I think I'm tasting rye, but I'm not as good at it as you are. <laughs> this is rye. Yeah. Yay! And it's high proof, too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's 160. It is, but I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, yeah, no, there's, there's plenty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to be, I didn't want to cheat you. No, 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 no. I, li I, I like the high proof stuff. And, and what I have noticed is that even your white there dog is, there tastes is. amazing. Yeah. I, it tastes like cotton candy. I that, mean, that is my, again, I'm going to go right back to tasting every step of the, if you want to make great whiskey, you taste it. If your white dog doesn't taste good, it's not going to come special out of the barrel. No. No, it's not. No, it's not. The yeah, barrel's going to augment, not fabricate. Exactly. Yeah. No, I love that philosophy, and I definitely can taste it in your product. So let's, uh, let's head on over and check out. Yeah, that's out. a spicy rye. That's a spicy rye. Weeded rye. rye. A weeded rye. Okay. Super yeah. viscous whiskey. Yeah, and, uh, the reason a lot of people don't like to work with wheat and rye is because it's too viscous. It's mm -hmm. hard to pump. It's very viscous. Hard to deal with. And you even when it's even when it's boiling, it the, the viscous boils up and tries to jump out of the fermenter. Right. Where you don't get that with corn whiskey. And do you uh, use anything to keep the the rye from gumming up and all that stuff while you're going through that process? We we do with the rye. We the have rye. To. we you have the, to rye. We have to with the rye. Yeah. yeah. So that's the only place we add a little bit of enzyme, a little bit of stuff to to keep keep it, from, it flowing. Yeah, because I've heard of, of it's uh, a nightmare. Fermenters you don't. like bubbling over and, <laughs> yeah. and fill, it's a nightmare the with place. the rye. Yeah, the wheat's almost as bad, and of course, corn's much better. All right, but yeah, we got a lot of that's got a lot of spice and cherry and yeah, some good cherry notes in there. That's sweet. Mm, it's good stuff. Let's go check out uh, your your barrel mm. warehouse. I'm going to talk to you about your barrels because you got some unique stuff going on there. Yeah. So out of here, out of here, we come back. We, we finish off about 160. Uh huh. Uh, and then we. Dilute to 120, 125, put in the barrel. Okay, so your barrel entry proofs around 120, 125. Yeah, I prefer 120, but financially 125 is better, but we probably do it about 120 most of the time. Gotcha. But we do keep a range in there just for interest. Yeah. You'll, you'll, we'll, we'll see a lot of people like to, you know, like to get up there that 127 mark, mm -hmm. 125, 127. They're real interested in those whiskeys up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they like a lot of bite. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see the traditionalist 110, 108, you know, that's kind of the Kentucky place mm -hmm. for those, right? For the for the barrels. And then normal, it's about, you know, 118, 120 is a real sweet spot. Gotcha. For cost versus... Versus flavor. Flavor. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, well, let's check out those barrels, and then we're going to head over to your tasting room, and I'm going to ask you the hard questions. All right, cool. <laughs> let's do it. All right, Bill, now we're over here in the barrel warehouse, and we do have a distillery dog running around. Yeah, Miley. Miley, come here. Come here, girl. Yeah, Miley. No, no distillery is complete Miley, here. without a distillery dog. Miley, here. Come here. Come here, girl. Is she a mouser at all? <laughs> she does whatever needs to be done. <laughs> She's a good girl. Her's a good girl. Her dice likes mice and ducks. Yeah, pheasants, chucker, quail. She likes, just likes them all. She'll get them all, whatever it is. <laughs> whatever it is, she'll get it. Awesome sauce. So we're standing here in front of the, the new uh, barrel racks, or new-ish. Uh, mm -hmm. First time I came out here, I don't think these were here yet. You put these in in uh, 20, late 2017. Yeah, yeah. so I think the first time I came out, they weren't here yet, and they're getting full, and they're full with great, big old, beautiful, these are 53-gallon barrels, right? Yeah, these are, yeah, American White Oak. American White from Oak. From the Ozarks, where I'm from originally, and uh, 
and made it an uh, independent stave company in Lebanon, Missouri, just north of the Arkansas, Missouri border. Independent stave. Do you know what char level you this guys stick with? This is a three to four. Three to four? Yeah. And any uh, toasting on these barrels? No, we don't. Now, some people char and toast and mm -hmm. mix. We don't do that. What we do is we put different uh, toasted woods inside okay. for the finish. For the finish. Okay. Right. So that we do it kind of differently. So it's it's kind of similar to the it's a hybrid the stage program that Makers yeah. Mark uses or yeah. something like that. Yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we've been doing that since day one. Gotcha. Gotcha. So we 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 do our own staves in these things. So that gives us a little little unique finish. Now I've been here several times to do barrel picks, and this is what I'm used to seeing is this this cute little guy here. Right. Um, and what size barrel is this? This is a 15 gallon barrel. So when we first started, we could not get in the queue for 53 gallon barrels, but also this 15 gallon barrel give you much more oak and vanilla, more mm -hmm. color, and that's why our, even our short age whiskey has so much color and flavor, right? Yeah. Because we use these small barrels. So the smaller the barrel, the more oak and vanilla you get, the more color you get. and uh, we can get it to market much faster. So, you know, it's, it's like two years, two years in this barrel in Texas is, is, is quite a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. In four years, in five years, what we're selling now out of these barrels is a huge, huge. amount yeah. of aging. It looks like ink when it right. comes out of that barrel. Yeah. Especially, I mean, we've, uh, we picked a short barrel the last time we came out here. We, we picked it up and we're like, uh, Brandon, this one's almost empty. And he's <laughs> like, it, it happens. Yeah. And we were, we were actually working on the first ever, uh, cash drink non-chill filtered mm -hmm. ultra small batch that right. Ronelm has ever released right. and uh, because the whiskey that you have that's ready for the market is from these smaller barrels and they don't yield a huge number and we have a good number of members of our club that are we know are going to want your whiskey we decided hey let's pick a handful of these smaller barrels mm -hmm. and let's blend them on site and, mm -hmm. and let's see what happens let's let's make yeah. our own small batch blend and while we were doing that, we found one barrel that was super weird, and it was almost empty. And, <laughs> and we were like, hey, Brandon, how many do you think are in here? And he's like, I don't know, 25 or 30. And so we had enough, enough people on the tasting team, we decided just to bottle that one for ourselves. And uh, I've given that to a couple people, and there has been more than one person that tried to sneak out of the house with my yeah, bottle. Because super, it's, concentrated. It's super concentrated. Super um, concentrated. I mean, super dark ink. And with your whiskeys, I consistently get a dried dark fruit, mm -hmm. like a, a raisin, mm -hmm. a prune, uh, the, a sai berry, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. Chocolate, yep. spearmint, very mm -hmm. common. Yeah. A lot um, of cherry. A lot of cherry. What, what else do you get on your whiskey? Um, I mean, you're the chemical, you know, engineer <laughs> type person. Uh, you so. know, I my palate's not as not as good as the wives or somebody like that, right? Sure. There, a lot of people can taste a hundred flavors, Thanks, yeah. you know, and I, I can't. I can't. I know what I like in harmony, but I'm not great at that. But yeah, you've hit on the main ones, right? You'll, you'll get kind of a, that whole licorice side, you know, and then the cherry side, the oak vanilla. And then one thing I notice is the anise. Mm -hmm. A lot. I notice a lot of yeah, that. Yeah, a lot of times you, you do get like a black licorice mm -hmm. flavor uh, from this. And I'll tell you a funny story. When I came here for a barrel pick, we picked three barrels and they were bottled separately and the club owner asked me to do a review of the whiskey so that the members could know which one would fit their palate and they right. know which bottle to go buy. And so my wife comes home and I've got note and pad out on the table right. and I'm like concentrating and I'm writing all these notes and I'm drinking from all three of these glasses yeah. and she comes up and, and she kisses me because she had just gotten home and, and she's like, oh my God, what have you been eating? And I was like, nothing, I'm just drinking this whiskey. And she goes, you know what it tastes like? And I was like, what's that? And there's these uh, packages of dried fruits that are like blueberries and- um, They're concentrated. Cra and they're basically dehydrated and they, or concentrated. And, yeah, and, they, and then they're cho they're covered in chocolate and they oh. sell them at Costco. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, 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 those little- uh, yeah, they, yeah. I love those, they're, they, they have- uh, and she, and she, They have blueberry and they have that other one. Uh, Asai. Yeah. It's uh, acacia or however yeah, you say, yeah, acacia. Know how to say it. Yeah, acacia, yeah, acacia. And, uh, yeah, those are good, they're those good. are addictive. And my wife thought for sure that that's what I had been eating, exactly. but I was actually just drinking her whiskey and she right. made a joke that we were gonna start a whiskey review channel where I drink the whiskey, she kisses me yeah, and gets the work, notes. It'll work, it'll work, it'll and work. And then I was like, ah, I'm afraid we'd attract the wrong type of uh, viewers. <laughs> uh, we opted out of that, but your whiskey was the inspiration for that. But uh, pretty excited about these larger barrels. Now, from a, from a aging standpoint or a matur maturation standpoint, what are you planning to do different with these barrels that you didn't do with the smaller ones? Well, let's talk about the small ones. So the small ones, what, you know, it was, it was on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. We did two things, right? We knew we could concentrate it with a smaller barrel. We also put it at 
120, 130 degrees in, in the shipping container. Okay. So, so we really aging. accelerated the aging. Every 10 degrees hotter, the aging doubles. Mm -hmm. That's why Kentucky ages twice as fast as Scotland, and we age twice as fast in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. But if you put these barrels in a shipping container in Texas, you just went to four times faster. The reactions are four times faster than they are just hanging around regularly. Right. So the sun's beating down on them, and that temperature stays hot in there. So that, now, the bad news is that makes great whiskey fast. The bad news is the angels drink most of it. Yeah. So the, as you go smaller barrel and hotter, the angel share goes up and up and up. Mm -hmm. So you're doubling and tripling and quadrupling the angel share. So are there chemical reactions that you're going to be able to hang out for with these larger barrels that you weren't able to hang out for with the smaller barrels? I, I, the, only th the only problem you get in the smaller barrel is you can get too oaky. Okay. So that's too the, much extraction. Too, too much extraction. So not even, enough esterification. Yeah, not enough right. whatever. Yeah, not the, second, the secondary reactions, the tertiary reactions that are, I think, the most critical in whiskey. Uh, you can get too much oak going mm -hmm. on. So that's the downside of small barrels. The good side is you can age it much faster, but you just can't go forever in a small barrel. Sure. Cannot do it. Right. Whereas you, you have a little bit more time. I have a little, a little bit more, more time flexibility. here. Flexibility. Right. Right. And what a lot of people don't realize, and I've, I've said this before when I was talking with people out here, is that barrel, uh, that your ability to access barrels as a producer is tied to the construction industry. Because right. when people uh, create lumber, mm -hmm. they are cutting all the, the mature trees yeah. on that tract of land. That's right. They're cutting the, the pines and they're cutting the oaks. Right. So if they stop cutting the pines because there's no demand for lumber, they also stop cutting the oaks. Mm -hmm. And now there's no way to get oak for barrels. Yeah. And when you guys started eight years ago, there was a huge barrel shortage that had been created by the downturn in the real estate market yeah. starting all the way back in 2007. And the whiskey turn up. And, and whiskey also was increasing. Mm -hmm. And so one question that I've always wanted to ask you is if you could have started with 53 gallon barrels, would you have, or would you have gone smaller so small. you could go to market? Gone small. So you go to market faster. Go to market faster. And the other choice is to put out unaged whiskey and I just won't do it. Won't do it. I will not do it. Won't <laughs> do it. I'm hardcore. I just won't do it. I mean, yeah. and, the, and you know, in a small distillery like this, not generate much revenue. I mean, the, the urge to put out unaged whiskey, whiskey is pretty is strong, strong, right? Because, yeah. you know, it's hard, right? And so you'll get in a big barrel and then you've got a two-year whiskey in a big barrel. Not ready. Yeah. Not, not even ready. close. Yeah. Awesome. So what we did, and we couldn't get these small barrels either. What we did is we bought white oak flooring from a buddy of mine in Northwest Arkansas because I grew up there, right? My dad was a contractor, a mm -hmm. custom home builder. And he, he got a buddy of his to sell us a truckload of lumber to build the first barrels. We could not get in the barrel queue anywhere. Oh my God. So we bought the oak from Buddy and then we shipped it to Hot Springs National Cooperage, the Gibbs Brothers down there, and they built barrels for us. Wow. We could not get barrels. Wow. In 2013. Huh. We had a huge problem. Do you have a bottle from your first barrel that you, that you finished aging? We did. That, that, yes. Yeah, there's very few left. That, that would be in the archive, though, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very, yeah, very few left, yeah. I'll tell you. And that, that's the whiskey. That whiskey that was in those barrels, that's the one that won the uh, Chairman's Trophy for, for the ultimate beverage, right? We won the Chairman's Trophy for that. The other winner was Pappy Van Winkle's 30. Wow. So <laughs> what I love about that is when they did the announcement, the winners are Lone Elm, and then Pappy was right <laughs> under us. <laughs> Two-year Lone Elm. Well, I got to be honest. I got a bottle of Pappy 20 in the house, and I'll drink Lone Elm over that. Yeah, that's day. what I said. That's what I said. But no offense, Pappy, guys. No, no offense. You make good whiskey. Yeah, it, yeah, mm -hmm. but the 20, for me, it's a little too much. So. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, why don't we uh, make it on over to the tasting room, and let's drink some whiskey, and I'll ask you a few questions. That's the important part. The important part. We, got to, we finally got there. We finally got there. All right, let's All right. do it. All right, well, here we are in your beautiful tasting room. Um, the bacon I, room. The what? The bacon room. The bacon. It does the, look a little bit. The roughs bit. on cedar call, reminds me of bacon. <laughs> it does. And hey, I love bacon and whiskey. Yeah, right. I do. So, you know, I think that that's a good combination. And we actually have a lineup of your, your products here. So kind of what I want to do uh, with this is we're going to sip and taste, give some notes, and I'll just ask you some questions as we go. So um, this first one that we're going to try, this is your small batch at 90 proof. Yes. And was this the first product that this you first product. released? Mm -hmm. And what was the reasoning behind the 90 proof? Is there it's, just, it's just standard. I mean, people are just used to drinking 90 proof whiskey. It's just a standard thing. And it's, it's, it's good proof for making drinks. Yeah. For cocktails. And for whatnot. cocktails, you're right. Yeah. yeah. It's just kind of standard, right? It's kind of industry standard. 90 proof. 80's too low and 90's... Hey, Miley. 80's too low and 90's just about right. Just about right. Okay. 
And you mentioned that you were in the semiconductor industry. Mm -hmm. We also talked about turning a large fortune into a small fortune. Right. <laughs> um, and so what, what was your background? How did you, you know, get to a place in your life where you had the financial ability to even start an enterprise like this? Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I basically uh, uh, started off at uh, Boeing Aircraft doing the B-2 and the F-22 programs. That's mm -hmm. where I started off. And then uh, I got tired of the rain in Seattle. Yeah. It's a nice place, but it rains all the time. So I wanted to come back home, and so I came back here and took a job with Texas Instruments. And there I was process integration manager. So basically I take all the processes, design processes, and put them all together to make semiconductors. It's about a thousand steps. Right. Very precise thousand steps. I'm one of the few people that you could tell that to that has any inkling because I, at one time, did recruiting, and one of our customers was a semiconductor chip manufacturer, mm -hmm. and they, they toured me through the plant and they explained to me all of the, you know, back then it just boggled my mind, all of the processes that those those uh, semiconductor plates had to go through, mm -hmm. not plates, but whatever they're called. Wafers. Yeah. Wafers before they could you be made You take sand and make wafers, yeah. you slice them, and then you do all this pattern and implanting and etching and you get billions of transistors on them and they do great things like no. run your iPhone or your computer or your car brakes or your count, engine control. Counting ones and zeros, counting ones and zeros. So Yeah, so I'm in, yeah, I was in the analog side where we, you know, take ones and zeros back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. So you can interface with it, right? On and, your, and so here you are, you have this great career, probably making some pretty decent money. And what was the the aha moment where you said, you know what, I want to I want to start this. I want to make, <laughs> make whiskey. I want to make whiskey. Okay, so I, that's it's a short story, but it, it so uh, uh, so me and four of my college buds were out in Kentucky gathering up our usual annual Bourbon Trail whiskey. Yeah. And we'd gone out there in 2011, and that's what really precipitated all this. We got out there in 2011, called ahead, and. Uh, met with the dis master distillers and did special tastings and all this. And when we got done, we realized we didn't have a great catch. We, we weren't bringing home the good stuff, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we realized there was such a run on bourbon. We just weren't, you know, in, in years past, we were bringing home this awesome collection of specialty stuff. And we got out there and we didn't get anything special. Huh. And so we took all that and we went back to uh, Beaver Lake in Northwest Arkansas. I've got a little cabin up there on the lake, mm -hmm. in, in, up in the Ozarks, a beautiful place. And that's my final retirement place. And uh, we're sitting around the campfire, drinking in line. And about midnight, I said, I can make better whiskey than this. I don't remember what we're drinking. I'm not going to tell you what we're <laughs> drinking. I said, I can make better whiskey than this. One of my roommates wrote a check and slapped it down on the table and said, I'd like to see that. And so we did. That was uh, Labor Day, September 2011. And we purchased this location. It's in December 2011. Oh my God. And started a distillery. And I, you know, I, I was just, we were just interested in whiskey, right? We love whiskey and we're just interested in it. And I think, I thought that would be a great retirement gig for me, right? So yeah. I could, I would have a lot of fun. I, I couldn't see myself sitting around. Mm -hmm. So I thought this would be a fun thing to do. Something I enjoy, right? Mm -hmm. And a little science in there, right? Sure, so it's sure. not, you know, there's a little science in there. And there's a lot of science, but we're doing a little science here at the moment. But, uh, uh, more, more seat of our pants here at the moment. But um, I thought that would be a great retirement career for me. So what were the whiskeys that you really loved before you started making your own? Oh, I, I was a big fan of William LaRue Weller's, his straight out of the barrel, yeah. uh, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So th that's really probably my favorite. Yeah. But, you know, I went to Scotland. I've been to Scotland, you know. I, there's nothing I don't like. Sure. But that was my favorite. Uh, I'm a big fan of... Uh, of uh, Blanton's, a big fan of uh, Four Roses, mm -hmm. but that's a more recent love. Than, right, yeah. From my childhood, you know, most of those bourbons come from Dr. Crow. Dr. Crow is the father of modern bourbon. He pretty much made, wrote the book on it. And you'll see that all, many of those are all the same mash bill. Sure. And, but they come out different, just 10 miles away or something, right? It's, right which is right. interesting, right? Sure. But they're exactly the same mash bill. And the grain probably comes from the same place. Right, yeah. But they come out slightly differently. Because the grain in, in, in Kentucky is pretty ubiquitous. But right. here, I find that there's wild differences from one distillery to the next to what their grain is. And therefore, their products are going to be quite different. Right. And right. so... So we've got a lot of stuff from up in the panhandle. We've got stuff local. But it's all Texas. So, and, and we were into being all Texas, right? So what's the, the one... The one well, I, let me ask the larger question first. 
If you could do it all over again, would you? Yeah, I would. Would you? <laughs> but I wouldn't recommend it to anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to recommend it to anybody else. You know, I had a passion for it. And, you know, I don't care if I die in poverty. Right, My sure. old age. So, uh, but I would, yeah, underfunded. Almost everybody's underfunded, and that's a disaster. Sure. You can't go the long haul. So I think that's the real problem is being underfunded. And, but you can... You can you can probably you can probably start a tiny small craft distillery out of your barn for a million. Yeah. Right. So what's the what's the if I were to ask you what's the biggest hurdle that that just really put a kink in the hose for you guys? Uh, distribution. What, distribution. We, we you know a lot of people. I hear a lot of people say, "Oh, the permitting was a nightmare. That was easy for us." And oh, getting you know getting the equipment. Facilitate. You know, we, we built everything. We facilitated everything. We did all ourselves, right? We got a lot of pretty good skill set within the group. And so that saved us a lot of money. Of course, it took time. Sure. But, but distribution is a rock wall for a small craft, right? Why, why is that? Uh, help, help John Cube consumer, like the average person, they're used to walking in and seeing Jim, Jack, Turkey, whatever on the shelves. Explain right. to them why that no is Miley. a difficult thing. No Miley. Thing. No Miley. It's okay. I got a pupper here off camera that needs some pets. <laughs> here, let me give you some pets. She's, no, she's a, she, she, yeah, she's, she's a lover, not a fighter. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, unless you're no, a chucker. So, so, yeah, yeah, unless you're a chucker. Yeah, then she don't like chuckers. Yeah. Um, it's a wall there because big distribution works on margins. And they're, we can't go around them. If you go around distri distributors, they would offer a much better product, but you can't. Right. It's mandated by law. So let me explain to everybody that's listening. We're talking about the three-tier system. Producer sells to the wholesaler, distributor. Um, the wholesaler, distributor sells yeah, to the true. retailer, and that is the way that it has to go. So you can't necessarily buy product directly from a producer in the state of Texas, except that they're able to sell up to 1.5 liters every 30 days to each individual, which is not enough to sustain Which the distributors the lobbied for. Right, right. And we couldn't even do that. When we started, we could not sell. Couldn't sell at all. So you we didn't pick a downtown location. We picked a location that was out, out in the country, country yeah. which was a better ecosystem choice. But if you were wanting to sell, you'd be, you know, in, in, in deep Ellum. somewhere. Yeah, you'd yeah. be right where, you know, you're in the middle of some traffic, right? But you could not sell out of your distillery when we started. Right. That was against the law. Then we finally got the ability to sell samples, basically, right, right, for marketing. Right. And, of course, in some states, Arkansas, Colorado, a couple of states, you can sell all you want out of your distillery. They have what they call uh, general commerce laws. Right. So if you make it there, you can sell, sell it, it there, right. which I think Texas should get around to, right? Well, what we're fighting for right now in Texas and the Still Strong Texas Initiative is to allow you guys, because you've spent years trying to attract people out here to this beautiful right. tasting room. Right. You have rabid fans that live all across the state. And unfortunately, because of limited distribution, limited right. production, they can't just walk into their liquor store and buy a bottle of your whiskey, no. even if they desperately want it. They want to buy it, but they're not able to go out and get it. And so what we've been working for here in Texas is for the right for you guys to be able to ship your whiskey to those individuals who come out and sign up for some sort of a club membership right. or whatever. Right. And I really hope that that changes. I hope that they'll take the limits off of how much you can sell to people when they do come to your Yeah, facility. if you come all this way, if you come all the way here from South Texas, drive six hours or even more. Right, yeah. And Texas you can buy place. two bottles. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Yeah. You're going to buy a case, right? You're right. going to take it home. You're not going to be back for another year, right? Sure. Or more, right? Sure. So it's, you want to get a case of whiskey. So, so we're working on that. But you guys did have to switch up who your uh, distributor was at some yeah, point. So th yeah, so when you're small, you know, you're going you're gonna to have to form some kind of partnership with a smaller distributor, right? Mm -hmm. And smaller distributors are fighting for shelf space with the larger distributors who have more money to throw around and can deliver more often. And that's better for the, the store. The store, because the bottles are all, they don't have to carry as inventory. much inventory, so they can stock. And we just, we hope that, we, I mean, what we hope is that the local sellers, you know, take into account that we're small Texas and build, help build Texas whiskey with us, right? Sure, sure. Partnership. And we're getting pretty good, getting some pretty good relationships in the stores. But it's tough, right? Because good we're small. Yeah. Well, and, and I've, I've often said, you might make the best whiskey in the world. It does not mean that your business isn't going to go belly up. Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, making the best whiskey in the world might put you in, <laughs> might put you in the poorhouse. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And so... So, there, yeah, there's a, there's a juxtaposition there. That, juxtaposition. That is, you know, two market, 
perfect product, you know, nobody, if it doesn't get out there or market, then you're in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. So word of mouth is a tough business, is this is business is tough. So you guys have a good bit of hardware. These bottles back here have uh, some, some awards on here. So what are some of the accolades that your whiskey's received? So we won that chairman's trophy with our two year and they, they really challenged that. They didn't believe our whiskey was two years, but two years at 130 degrees is a lot of age. <laughs> there wasn't much left in those barrels. So that original whiskey was uh, uh, proof down to 90, but was just coarse filtered like the barrel proof. Sure. And that whiskey won the best whiskey. We got the chairman's trophy for that. And that was our two year. But they challenged that. They said there was no way that whiskey was two years old. So they tested it. Mm. They, we were right. We, we told them it's right. two years old. <laughs> you know, I had to get on the phone and explain to them that it was two years in a small barrel in a hot box in Texas. Right. And that's like 10 years anywhere else, right? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So, so yeah, so we got that chairman's trophy. And then we won gold in New York, Chicago, San Francisco. On, on every product we have is one gold. And as it's starting to catch on, you're starting to get some calls from we other are. areas? We are, we are, we're moving out. We're, we're, we're starting to get a slow distribution in, in multiple states, but it's very slow. And we're doing independence in each state. It's not like we have a distributor that's in 29 states, right? Right. Boom. So we're small distributors in each state working that relationship, right? And we're also in Germany. Woohoo! We, we made a big splash in Germany. They made some, if, if you have time, YouTube, do the YouTube Germany thing and listen to the whiskey reviews. It's yeah. fun. Well, and, and that's one of the things that I really love about Texas whiskey is, is I believe that Texas whiskey is going to make its mark on the world for this one, one reason only. And that is Texas has its own brand right. outside of the United States. Right. And it's, it's generally a pretty positive brand. Yeah, they call us the cowboy whiskey. The cow cowboys. Right. You guys are cowboys. The yeah, cowboys, okay, right. Cool. And so they're excited to be able to be a part of whatever that thing yeah. is. And so as we get large enough to distribute to other areas, I really feel like that's going to help open up other markets. Right. And so I'm, I'm very excited. So what's in the future for Lone Elm Whiskey? Like uh, growth-wise, you said that you can produce about one barrel per day. Right now. But right we, can, now. we can quadruple that production if we need to. If so. you needed to without changing out equipment, without mm -hmm. more capital investment. You A can, small capital investment, some more firm renters. But no, we can really, we can quadruple production almost overnight. Overnight. But right now the demand's not there, right? We're staying ahead. Sure. But you gotta think long term in whiskey. Sure. Exactly. <laughs> you well, don't know when that demand's gonna hit, right? Exactly. So you still gotta stay ahead. And and then one day all of a sudden you've got bang and then you're short. You've got four X demand yeah. for then then age. And then eight years later you can deliver. <laughs> you can deliver in eight years. <laughs> so you don't wanna do that, right? Yeah. So this year we're doubling production. So is that the goal with the larger barrels? Are you trying to get to an, an eight-year eight age well, product? Well, I, I think or? it'll probably be good at six at in six. Texas. Eight's typical in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. That would say probably four in Texas, but I think probably for us. Maybe six. Maybe six. Somewhere in there. But I don't know yet. I have yeah. the oldest one in the big barrels, 2017. And so we so really only don't four. know how it's I don't know be. yet. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's like watching your child Not quite up. ready. Not yeah. quite ready. You're, you're, you're not, you're but not that, for sure. The big barrels we haven't done in the hot house. We don't make Cool Hand Luke whiskey. Those have all been just normal Texas temperatures, so about twice as fast as Kentucky. Wow, wow. On average. So now, we actually, part of the, my impetus for coming out here, we talked a little bit about the first ever small batch cash drink non-chill mm -hmm. filtered that we have coming out through... Uh, Someone Say Whiskey, mm -hmm. uh, the Facebook-based whiskey mm -hmm. club that I help uh, administer. And you guys have an event. This uh, podcast is going to uh, air this Friday, uh, which I think is the 10th. And then the following Friday, or the following, no, it'll be the 9th. And the following yeah. 17th, Saturday 17th. the 17th, we have a big event going on out here. So tell the people what all you have going on to attract them to want to come out and check, check it out. Well, if Brandon told me, I'd know. <laughs> he hasn't told me yet. I know, I know we're having something, but I don't. What's, what are we doing, Brandon? Well, we got competition barbecue, right? Competition bar. What? We, got, we have some different barbecues. We have someone from, uh, we have Jasper's Uptown coming in. Okay. Uh, to do some catering, and, you know, we're going to have a couple bands out here. So we're gonna hey, we're having a party. We're having a party. We're See, they haven't told me the details. Yeah, they just right. told me, hey, Bill, be here. Doing, on, be here. Thing. We're going to do so something. So there's going to be live music. Live there's music. There's going to be a couple barbecue. barbecues. Mm -hmm. There's going to be Jasper's from downtown, mm -hmm. high-end cuisine. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's going to be some tours. There's going to be plenty of whiskey to drink. We might pop a barrel or two. We might pop a barrel or two. We're going to see. And some would say whiskey uh, members, you're going to be able to come out here and not only have an amazing experience, but you're going to be able to pick up your bottle of the first ever cash drink non-chill filtered 
small batch, ultra small batch. The ultra uh, small batch, yeah, I mean, three it's barrels. Only, it's four <laughs> barrels, sorry. Four, yeah, three or four barrels, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so we're very excited about that. And Bill, I just want to say thank you for all the hospitality that you and your staff have always shown me and the whiskey community. You guys have been great to deal with. If you're listening to this and you've never had a chance to try their whiskey, um, reach out. I'll see if I can get you a sample. It's phenomenal. And if you live in a state where they have distribution, they have barrels for sale, people. And I'm telling you, this, <laughs> this stuff is amazing. It's really, really good whiskey. You can tell we don't like tuck whiskey. Yeah, and it's, and it's, <laughs> and, and it's, it's unique. It's not, it doesn't taste like the other Texas whiskey. So if you've yeah. had other Texas whiskeys and, you and, you, and, and you're not a huge fan, do not roll out Lone Elm because they do have their own thing going on with their wheat whiskey. Yeah, we're not like, we don't want to be like anybody else. Don't want to be like anyone else. This guy is, they crack the mold. He's one of a kind. So, um, anything else you wanna you wanna add before we cut out? No, I mean we're we we've got some new products coming up too. Oh yeah, that's right. We've got Let's a El, we got an Elbin weeded rice coming out. Uh, it's not ready yet, but we will have a launch party soon and uh, a small batch launch party. The main production won't be ready for two years, but we have some small batch stuff that's going to come out. We've got a barrel aged gin that's coming not to out. Not get anyone in trouble, but I did get a little taste of that rye, <laughs> and it's it's really. I'm gonna cut, it's really fucking good. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, go ahead. That's the way I like it. <laughs> and we got a barrel aged gin coming out. That's coming soon, if you like gin, mm -hmm. but it's different. It's not like regular gin. Right, and you guys have a wheat, uh, a wheat vodka that's, yeah. that's Our wheat got quite a bit of flavor. Luckily, they changed the law. Now, vodka doesn't have to be flavorless. Yeah. It can have a flavor uh, reminiscent of its yeah. original grain, so they're not breaking the law, but they have a very delicious wheat vodka. Yeah, so we came, you know, when we first came out here and we, were, we had to wait two years for whiskey, of course, what did we do? We made some vodka that and whiskey did. drinkers yeah. would drink, right? Yeah, for sure. You know, why not? Yeah, let's do it. And then... Um, you guys might be doing some finished barrel products. We will do finish, any, any finish anybody wants okay. for, for our barrel club. For the barrel club. Okay. We haven't got them in commercial. It's not ready for commercial prime time, but if you're interested in a special finish, let's do it. Well, and that's, that's, that's actually breaking news because that, that, that's never been announced before. That's correct. Typically, they have not done uh, barrel finished products yeah. and... He's such a purist, but the, <laughs> the whiskey nerds kept begging. <laughs> yeah. and, and, they, and they wore me down. They wore him down slowly but surely. But we're doing that as part of our barrel club. Now, if you want to make your own whiskey, if you've got a great recipe in mind, one of my favorite things is doing the two weekend course where I teach everybody how to make whiskey. Did you hear that, people? You make your own whiskey, so you, you make your own barrel. You can come here, do a, a two week course, and you can make your own whiskey, and they will age it for you here and bottle it when it's ready. You'll bottle it. Yeah, I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's amazing. It's an amazing, like I've seen a group from, from TI here right. making whiskey. It was funny though, because uh, Brandon was turning me around and I, I go over to the still and he's like, do you, wanna, do you wanna taste their mash bill? And I was like, yeah, sure. So he pulls a little off of the little device that we used earlier and I take a sip and I walk up and I tell the head guy, I'm like, oh man, I'm tasting your white dog. And, and it's great. And he goes, don't drink my whiskey. <laughs> And I hadn't thought of it, but it was his whiskey. I yeah. mean, he, was, he was ready to have it made. Whack. So, yeah. so, um, That'll cost you. Yeah, no. So there's some opportunities here. So you can you can check out uh, Five Points. They have. Yeah, we'll make single malts. We'll make rice. We'll make bourbon. We make it all. They're on Facebook. They're on Instagram. Right. Five Points Distilling. Uh, they also have a separate page for uh, Lone Elm Whiskey. So check that out. And if you'd like to get more information about Bourbon Real Talk, you can find that at bourbonrealtalk.com. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook forward slash Bourbon Real Talk. You can find us on Instagram. And we would really love it if you would subscribe, like, review, and comment on your favorite podcast player and on YouTube as well. Even if you're not gonna watch on both platforms, it helps me if you subscribe on both because the algorithm will show the content to more people. So if you like this, get on out there and get involved. And as always, if you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time. I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cheers. Cheers. Let's cheers it up. This content is being brought to you by the Bourbon Real Talk American Whiskey Aroma Kit. This is a tool that I put together to help all you whiskey aficionados out there develop your palates. You can sit down with the vials and train your senses, or you can sit down with a great dram and break that whiskey down to its components. If you have any interest in purchasing a kit of your own, head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com forward slash shop and pick one up. Thank you for listening.